one of the biggest risks right now. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and abandon your hardware wallet because it's still the most secure device you have. The Ledger device, and I can say this unequivocally, as it is today, the one sitting on your desk that you have money in is still perfectly safe. It's a tamper-proof, high security device. It's well designed. Um, and unless you do something precipitous, it's perfectly fine. Um, the biggest risk I see right now is SIM swapping. Uh, and we're already seeing accounts of this happening. So who wants to, who wants to take this? What is, swim, what is SIM swapping? Um, Peter? Wait, has, has no, I, no, I'm pointing up to Jameson. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Has Literally up there. Been, it's like the Brady Bunch. I'm pointing upwards. T T Taylor, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, has everyone here been sim swapped? All four of us? No. I have no. never been sim swapped, but that's because. Um, Wait, am I the only one who's been sim swapped? I I took extreme precautions starting in 2013 um, because. You're before, you gotta no, I got doxed early on. I got yeah. doxed in 2013. They they got my email, my phone number and my home address published on Twitter in 2013. It was a, a malicious doxing, and it, it forced me to take all kinds of off-site -like precautions, which I wouldn't have had otherwise. So right. go, Taylor, tell us all about your wonderful SIM swapping experience. Oh, it's so much fun. Um, I will say that I did get SIM swap, but they didn't get anything because I had already delinked my phone number from any account anywhere. So I did get a whole bunch of like notifications saying they're trying to get into this. I got a Microsoft Authenticator that was like, um, here's your requested 2FA code that I didn't request, things like that, but they weren't able to get anything. But essentially what happened was um, they called up my cell phone provider, which is AT&T, and they, keep in mind, I'm not the owner of the account, nor am I even an admin of the account. I am a literal child of the account. So they called up at and over and over and over again, um, trying to get them basically saying, I broke my phone. I need you to move my SIM, my phone number from this SIM that is on my phone to my new phone, which is the hacker's phone. They couldn't give the PIN. They couldn't give the security questions. They couldn't even get the name on the account because again, I'm not on the account. Um, Unfortunately, you know, they're talking to people that are getting paid literally nothing in the Philippines, and they were eventually able to get information like the account holder's name from the support people. Uh, it took them like, I think maybe four hours or so in many attempts. Anytime they came up to a roadblock, they would just hang up and call right back. Um, so, so, so this is a classic um, escalation this is attack. Super classic. So can, yeah. can we just dive into that? Because I, I don't think people understand how this works. The, the, oh yeah. It's, okay. So it's, first of all, what is SIM swapping? SIM swapping is hijacking the telephone number and redirecting yeah. it to a new device, a different SIM, yeah. um, so that text messages and phone calls now go to someone else. While right. you're sitting at home, right? Your right. phone simply stops working. You don't know why. You might not even notice for hours that it stopped working, right? Because I was asleep, so I literally didn't notice, but even when I woke up, I didn't notice because I was connected to the Wi-Fi because I was at home. Right. And so things were still coming through. It wasn't, I mean, I was aware that I was under attack, so I obviously like went and looked, but if I hadn't been aware of that, I don't know how long it would have been, probably until I tried to make a phone call until I would have noticed that uh, I had no cell service because again, you're on Wi-Fi, everything's on Wi-Fi these days. So, so let's talk a bit about how this attack is executed. So this is an escalation attack. What they do is they start by calling customer service at Verizon, AT&T, Vodafone, whoever. Um, they say, hey, I'm the owner of the phone number. They have the phone number. They need something to start, either a name or a phone number, usually a phone number. Right? Yeah. If they have the phone number, they're trying to find out the name. If they have the name, they're trying to find out the phone number. If they have both, they're already a step ahead. Right. And then they try to say, okay, let me in. And the person says, you don't have the account information. Yeah. So then it turns into a social engineering attack. And they have a variety of ways. These sim swappers, they share tips with each other and they've been doing this for a while. So. 
ways that I've heard that they sort of get past the barriers, like having a pin on your account for security or not having the required information or whatever is, um, for me, they basically were able to glean information from the support people until they had the required information. So the they'll badger way. one of the people, yeah. get a snippet of information, hang up, call someone else, and then use that snippet of information to build to the next level, get a bit more information, hang up, call another person, and keep building until they've put together enough pieces of the puzzle that the last person they can persuade that they exactly. are the account owner and get so the for me, For my case, everyone thinks my name's Taylor Monahan, but that's my married name. Yeah. So they had to go from Taylor Monahan to my maiden name and then to that account holder's name, which is, I'm a child, obviously. Um, so that's, and they were able to get all of those jobs they were able to get from the customer support people. The other scary way they do it though, is that they pretend to be, uh, they pretend to be a person that's like sitting in a store, like an at t employee physically in a store. And they say, hey, our system's on the fritz. Um, I can't get my little code thing. I have an irate customer here. Can you just do this favor for me? And if the customer support agent doesn't like verify all the, they have one, one, they don't have time base. They have like the one time password things for the customer support or for the in-person agents. If they, you know, if they just don't check that stuff, they can, they can bypass it all. So I, I, there's a fantastic video you can watch on YouTube, which is one of the masters of social engineering. Uh, I don't remember her name. She's a fantastic social engineering hacker doing a demonstration at DEF CON for, or Black Hat, for a journalist. And she sits down with the journalist in a cafe and she asks the journalist for just one piece of information. I think it was the phone number. Um, she pulls up a video on YouTube which has a baby screaming in the background. She so then connects, calls up the phone company and is like pretending to be having a conversation with a babysitter who is over her head with the baby. The baby's screaming, the babysitter's asking questions. And so she's on the phone with customer service and goes, yeah, I, I need my husband's account. He's at the office right now. There's been an emergency. I need him to get to the hospital. Katie, can you please get the kid off the table? Okay, I'll be right there. I'm on with Variety. Just what? I'm sorry. I'm having a meltdown here. Please just help me. This is so terrible. My husband's... And playing on empathy, a sense of urgency, um, the desire of human people to, 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 to help, right? In, this, in a crisis, in an emergency. You hear this mother who's losing her shit. <laughs> There's a baby screaming. It's chaos. And eventually, the, the astonishing thing about this video is in, in six minutes, they have the account information, the PIN number, they've ported the SIM, and they have complete control of the journalist's account. Six minutes. Um, <laughs> the journalist was like, fuck, what do we yeah. do? And the well, crazy thing that I learned from my SIM swapping experience, because obviously I went right up the totem pole and found out everything I possibly could, I was amazed to learn that they have some training programs for their customer support agents in, in regards to SIM swapping. But what they tell them is they say that there's these terrible people out there that try to steal the SIM swap or try to get into the account so that they can buy a new iPhone to the account. And that's the threat, right? The threat is that this bad actor is gonna charge an iPhone to an innocent person's account. So at the end of the day, what these customer support agents are scared of is absolutely nothing because they're being paid 50 cents an hour to answer irate customers' phone calls. Right. And at the end of the day, they know that at t will pay back that iPhone. They have no idea the implications of what a SIM swap can actually do and the damage it can actually do. Yeah, I think Mike, Michael Turpin lost like $15 million or some, or 50 million, yeah. I, I don't he remember, it's some ridiculous. Like the uh, AT&T, we handed it over twice. Right. All right. So what, SIM swapping is this. Why is SIM swapping a risk? If someone has your phone number and they know you are into crypto, they can assume that many of the people in this database have used that phone number to set up um, 
the crappy form of two-factor authentication, which is a text message to the phone number. They will then, they are not going after the money that's on your ledger. What they're doing is they're assuming if you have money on a ledger, you also have an account with one of the top 10 exchanges. They're going to hit every account on every one of these exchanges with the email address. They can do something very simple, which is send or click on a link saying they forgot the password to see if they can find uh, information. Now, good sites will not tell you if the account exists. Bad sites will tell you if the account exists. They're then going to try and do a password reset, or they're going to get uh, a text message verification. They'll do a SIM swap. They will get the text message. You won't. Uh, you may not notice the email. Uh, if they're smart, they're going to use the fact that they know your physical address, figure out your time zone, and do it while you're sleeping. You wake up in the morning and you find 20 emails from Coinbase saying password reset, password reset, password reset, password change confirmed, login from an unusual device, withdrawal approved. And you're like, what? And you just woke up, right? And this can happen with any exchange. But it's not just exchanges because they're going to drain your exchange. Then if your bank account is still connected to your exchange, they're going to buy crypto from your bank account, drain your bank account, and then drain the crypto. And then they're going to find out from your, um, from your uh, cryptocurrency exchange what your bank is. Then they're going to try and log on to your bank and use two-factor authentication there they almost always use SMS. Banks are the worst offenders. So then they're going to go into your bank account to do a wire transfer or a Zelle transfer or something else, right? Yeah, so and I want to say as well, one thing that we've, we've really, really, really often seen is they will SIM swap a person and then they will go after that person's primary email, which is usually a Gmail. And there's two ways to go about this. The first is that you have your phone number linked to your Gmail uh, as a two-factor method. So if you have that that phone number as a recovery method on Gmail, even if you have a YubiKey, even if you have the authenticator, it doesn't matter. You just click the like use a different method until you get the phone number. Now they're in your primary Gmail. Now they know every service you use because you have receipts in your Gmail. So then they're like, okay, well they have a Binance and a Coinbase and a Kraken and a BlockFi. And then they go log into those and between your primary email and your phone number, they can access any of those accounts very, very quickly. And they do it, they just systematically wipe you out. It's when we when we talk to people who have been who are like trying to recover from this situation, it is it's unfathomable, like the the loss that occurs and how many things they touch and how many how much time it takes to even discover what's been touched. Because again, if they're in your primary email, they don't just like leave the email that says, you know, withdrawal confirm or buy 10,000 Bitcoin confirm. They delete those emails. And so getting the receipts to figure out what's actually lost sometimes can take weeks. And it's, it's atrocious. It's tragic. It's, you know, I think that phone numbers as a recovery method for any account, but especially for an email account is uh, one of the best things you can do. Like removing that is one of the best things you can do for your security. Yeah, and this is because your primary email is essentially your digital identity at this point. And so what we're really saying is the SIM swapping, the phone attack is an escalation attack to get to your primary email because generally people have that as a recovery for their email address. So, you know, the common theme that we're seeing is these days we have all types of great security hardware devices. We've talked about Ledger, we've talked about YubiKeys, but the weak point now is always the humans. So we're seeing social engineering attacks against employees of different services. We're seeing phishing attacks against all types of different users. Um, you know, even within the SIM swapping sphere, I have heard of stories of just employees of mobile phone providers being straight up bribed because once again they're probably getting paid minimum wage and if a sim swapper knows they're going to make tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars then why not you know 
pay a few hundred or a thousand dollars to bribe the employee and just just bypass all that tedious grinding away of having to ask all of these monotonous questions of you know being able to socially engineer people so you know what you're going to find is the security people are going to tell you you know eliminate any points of failure where a human can be tricked into doing something use dedicated hardware devices that are you know creating these codes so that you you know that you are in physical possession of the authentication and you you can't just have some random person on the other side of the world get tricked into authenticating something without you being there okay we have three specific points of advice now uh and uh jameson i i, I would like you to take a lead in this in terms of giving us this information because i've been talking too much um <laughs> the first one is uh, lock down your primary email account. Let's talk about how we do that. The second one is moving from SMS to FA to TOTP and U2F. The third one is moving your phone service provider, your, your, your um, communications provider, to a no human carrier, MVNO, Google Fi, uh, Ifani, etc. Go. Um, Jameson, please. Sure. Yeah, so primary email account, very important. And because of its importance, a lot of these email providers will give you a variety of different methods of how to recover access to it because we wouldn't want you to get locked out, right? So, you know, the more recovery methods that you add onto a service, the more potential security holes you're creating. You have to be very careful about this. Everyone so is a backdoor, our, right? Every exactly. recovery method you have to think of as a backdoor as well. Yeah, so if at all possible, you know, do not even tie a, a mobile phone to your email address whatsoever. The, the most important basic thing is, of course, to have an extremely strong, unique password that you're not using with any other service because, once again, information wants to be free. Any password you use with any service, you should assume that it's eventually going to get leaked and compromised and attackers are going to go take that password and try to use it at every other popular service. Anyone who runs a uh, you know, popular web-based service sees these drive-by attacks happen every time there's a major leak. So in order to do that, you're probably going to want to use a, a password manager that is able to generate highly long, complicated uh, passwords that you know, you shouldn't even know them. Uh, you should, you know, be letting some other password manager service handle these for you. And ultimately, I think you should only really know one password, and that is the password to unlock your password manager. And okay, hopefully, you're three, also using other three recommendations of password managers. I'm just going to jump in. Not endorsements. Sure. These are not specific products. I have no affiliation. The most common ones people use: LastPass. One password and an open source version of all of the above, Bitwarden. Those are good. I think you missed out Dashlane. Dashlane's pretty good as well. I've yeah. used all three. Very I good. really like Dashlane as well. And and you know, any one password manager is better than none password manager. This is not a let me look at all of the features and take three months to decide. This is a get one, use it. They're free, you can use them. So you remember one password which is probably in the form of a passphrase because it's a lot easier to type, transcribe, back up, and remember six to eight English words separated by spaces, all lowercase, a little phrase. You type that in, that's your one password. And then everything else is a 37 character alphanumeric random mess that you can't <laughs> replicate, right? Except for your banking websites that have a cap of like 18 characters. <laughs> I like to try and probe and discover the cap by yeah. producing outrageously long passwords. I did a video called Password and Two-Factor Authentication. It's a live stream that is published on my channel. It's two hours of talking about how you do these things from correct horse battery staple to um, how to do uh, basic two-factor authentication. Okay, so very long password with a password manager. So you change your password. Um, let's look at more specifically. Uh, I think um, almost a third of the ledger database was Gmail accounts. And a whole bunch of others was custom domain Gmail accounts that people were not able to see are actually Gmail accounts. Um, so let's speak specifically about Google accounts. Um, any specific advice there? Uh, so you can definitely 
not have a phone number connected. Uh, Google also has a YubiKey integration, which I am a fan of. Um, and I mean, I recommend YubiKey for as many services as support it. And in fact, uh, I would recommend using a YubiKey to protect your password manager. So hopefully whatever manager you're using also has YubiKey integration. So that's a, a little USB device. It's, uh, this one is one of the nanos. It sits flush inside the USB slot so that the only thing that's sticking out is this thin sliver of metal for me to touch. Um, you can also get ones that sit on your keychain. They cost anywhere from $30. You can even get non-branded ones, even cheaper, $30 to $50. Um, you can set that up as your second factor authentication on your Google account. Um, I want to make one more mention. Google has a special pro, uh, program called the Advanced Protection Program. If you search for that, Google Advanced Protection Program, it is a um, it is a, a website. Uh, sorry, a, a page that you go to that takes you step by step through the process of hardening and locking down your Google account. It adds either application-based two-factor authentication. That's the little app you run on your phone that produces a new six-digit numeric code every 30 seconds, or even better, two hardware security keys that you plug into your laptop or phone to use to authenticate. You remove the recovery phone number so that you cannot recover through a phone number. You remove the recovery email and um, you lock that account down. Any other advice? I was trying to remember whether or not Google has recovery questions, uh, but just in general, whenever I do run into a recovery questions type of uh, flow, instead of putting in answers, which are usually really common things that someone could search for, um, I actually like to just, once again, generate really long you know, passphrases, store those in the password manager. Uh, don't want that to become a potential vector where someone can use public information or, or other easily searchable information about myself or my family. Right, what is the city of your birth? Asparagus, <laughs> banana, couch, telephone. Um, and that answer goes in the password manager. So the next time I connect to JP Morgan Chase and they ask me, what is the city of your birth? I know that the answer is actually asparagus, banana, telephone, couch. Um, none of the knowledge-based answers are actually knowledge-based answers because of course, all of that information is on Facebook. Um, if you have a Facebook account. All right, let's move on. Um, changing from SMS to factor to other forms of two-factor. We've touched on it. Um, let's go into a bit more uh, detail. Yeah, so Google Authenticator, I think, is what a lot of people start out with. Uh, it's very easy to install on your phone, and I think that they finally fixed it so that you can actually migrate between phones now without having to rotate everything. Personally, if you're a little bit more hardcore, if you go with the YubiKey, then I am a fan of using Yubico Authenticator, which is basically the same thing, except those secrets get stored on the hardware. You have to give it a tap uh, in order to access it, and then you can carry that around and even plug it into multiple devices. Yep. Um, there, there's other, there's uh, Duo Security, there's Authy, um, there's a bunch of other, um, all of these follow a single standard. The standard is called Time-Based One-Time Password or TOTP. That's where you are presented with a QR code. You scan that QR code. The QR code actually contains a secret key that is the basis for generating a time-based sequence. Um, your clock is synchronized with the server so that uh, every 30 seconds it produces a new six-digit numeric code. Um, the server tolerates uh, you know, up to two before and two after, so you don't have to be absolutely precise. Um, and, and that gives you a great mechanism. If you use a, a time-based one-time password that has the ability to migrate um, to a different phone, make sure that that is turned off unless you are actively in the process of migrating. A good example is Authy. Authy has a fantastic multi-device feature. 
If you have that multi-device feature turned on all the time, then SIM swapping can actually migrate your Authy to a new phone, and then it's pointless. So make sure that's off. And then yeah, I, I want to harp on that too because yes, please go. By default, it's on. Yes. So if you on the, you need to go into your settings. It's called like multi-account or multi-device or something. Mm -hmm. Turn it off. Um, double check. And then the best way to actually check to see if a hacker could get it if they got your phone number is to go grab one of your old phones, boot up Authy, and then try to recover your Authy account, right? And so Authy will, you, you're, you're gonna say like, yeah, I want to, to like load in my Authy. I don't wanna start a new one or whatever. And they're gonna ask for your phone number. If you type in that phone number and it sends you a text and it reads the text and then all your codes are in there, a SIM swap can destroy your life. Yeah. So what should happen is that you put in your phone number and you get an error message that says something like, uh, your Authy doesn't have multi-device turned on, so we can't do this. Because that means if you get some swap, the attacker will see that error message and not see uh, all of your two-factor codes. Um, great. So that's TOTP um, and U2F. Let's quickly go to a question which is relevant here. According to the email that I received from Ledger, my cell phone number was exposed. I have some crypto wallets on my cell phone. Do I need to change my cell phone number? Good question. I Okay, so this is my advice. You don't necessarily need to change your cell phone number, especially if that cell phone number is important to you, socially speaking. However, you do need to remove that cell phone number in regards to how it ties into your crypto identity and crypto holdings. So for example, if that's the only phone number that your grandmother uses and your grandmother cannot possibly learn a new phone number, then no, don't change your cell phone number. However, go into Coinbase and delete that cell phone number from it entirely. Go into all of your accounts, go into your Gmail, go into every single account you have and just remove that phone number from any of your online things. Use that phone number for your social in real life relationships and then use other quote unquote burner numbers um, for, for online situations that demand your phone number. Which by the way, there's not that many that actually demand your phone number. You can also just use a fake phone number in a lot of cases to get through, uh, say, the shipping process. All right, uh, quick, quick point on burner numbers. So everyone's heard this burner numbers. And you're probably thinking like, this is an episode of The Wire and I'm going to go to uh, 7-Eleven and I'm going to get a car phone warehouse um, phone in a plastic shell and I'm gonna use a burner phone. This is the internet age, people. Um, Quacker.io, Q-U-A-R-C, uh, sorry, Q-U-A-C-K-R dot I-O. Um, it's in the chat, it's in the description. Basically, what this website gives you is, it gives you a list of numbers. You take any one of these numbers and you plug it into a website that maybe needs to send you a special code or something like that. And then you can go on a public page and see every text message that's been sent to that number, including the previous people who used it. Um, for their Amazon account. It's actually hilarious to go in there, click on those and watch what people are sending to text messages to it. What that allows you to do is get past those hurdles, get your account set up, and then you can delete it or even leave it. And, um, and that's, that's that. Don't allow that to be a recovery mechanism, obviously, uh, but it's a good kind of throwaway number if someone insists on having a phone number for you. Jameson, you were about to say something. Uh, some services are starting to get wise on burner phone numbers. I've, I've run into a few services where they'll somehow detect it and block you. Um, I've also run into some other services where on the back end, depending on how their SMS integration works, if it's not like a real carrier, then the SMS might not go through because some, mm -hmm. some cheaper services actually use these email SMS gateways that are only really run by the major providers. But um, I know I, I mentioned earlier that I had not been SIM swapped in. That was 
kind of luck really. I was one of the very early adopters of Google Fi and they just so happened not to have you know, customer service that had the ability to reset people's uh, phones and, and port them over. And so uh, my phone number was discovered by a number of people over the years. And if they ever tried to, to port it, I don't even know, I never got any notifications, but it requires a pin in order to do that. And so of course, nobody, uh, was able to get through that process. And I think there's a few others as well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff can be very uh, jurisdiction or geographic uh, uh, based. Like I think Google Fi is only still available to Americans. And I think it's also available to Canadians, but let's, let's talk about this in a bit more detail. So um, I was a Google Voice customer even before Google Fi, five years before Google Fi, uh, since 2002 or 2003, um, very, very early. And, and I wasn't sim swapped because of that. So Google Voice number is a number that was a ver one of the first virtual phone numbers that would just redirect to email for SMS and things like that. Google Fi is a cellular provider. I'm a Google Fi customer as well. Uh, FI, Google Project Fi, FI. Uh, and you can find that at fi.project.google, uh, I believe is their um, domain. Now, what is Google Fi? Google Fi is what they call a mobile virtual network operator or MVNO. A mobile virtual operator is basically almost like um, an overlay service that buys um, the ability to use other phone networks uh, and then resells that under their own brand. So um, what's, what's the one they have for really inexpensive pay-as-you-go phones that's very popular in the US? I, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, AT&T Go has one and then Boost is the one with Boost. the commercial. Yeah, Boost is one that everybody knows. So Boost is a classic MVNO. Uh, and th this is typically offered in low income neighborhoods as a no strings attached, pay as you go type option that's, that's uh, branded differently. When you use one of these services, you're usually using either T-Mobile or Sprint um, and now Sprint T-Mobile. In, in other countries, you're using some variant of Vodafone or one of the companies that are the national, the former national carriers. Um, and they resell their networks for MVNOs. And they have roaming agreements so you can work it in different countries. Bottom line is this, you get a SIM card from a company that doesn't actually have cell phone towers. They're allowing you to piggyback on somebody else's cell phone towers, but they manage all of the account numbers and the account management and the phone numbers. And Google has one of these called Google Fi and before that Google Voice. The best part about Google Fi and the reason these MVNOs are better is because they don't have customer service people. And because they don't have people, you can't socially engineer them. Uh, in order to port my Google Fi number, you have to have the YubiKey that's sitting in my laptop. So that's impossible to do. There's a specific company called Ifani, E-F-A-N-I, that was started in Silicon Valley a few years ago that is designed to be a SIM swap impossible company and is, is beloved by crypto people uh, because of that capability. It's the same kind of thing. It's a bit more expensive. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you'd like to support me in my mission of educating people about Bitcoin and open blockchains all around the world and publishing free content under Creative Commons licenses, please consider subscribing to the channel, sharing this video, as well as supporting me on patreon.com slash A-A-N-T-O-N-O-P. Thank you.